Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. According to the National Kidney Foundation, one in ten people will have a kidney stone in some time in their lives. It's one of the most common reasons men and women seek emergency care. In this program, we take you inside a local operating room at the Healthiest Kidney Stone Institute at St. Joseph's Hospital, where surgeon Andrew Portis performs a procedure to successfully remove kidney stones from a 20-year-old male patient. Stay tuned to after the procedure when Dr. Portis explains why complete removal of all stones is highly effective and why the Healthiest Kidney Stone Institute is the first ever to be awarded national certification by the Joint Commission for Disease-Specific Care for Kidney Stones. We now join the procedure in progress. We routinely use a rigid cystoscope with a preloaded 8 trench dilator to initiate stone procedures. Our 20-year-old young man is at low risk for unsuspected bladder pathology. The bladder is briefly inspected. The right ureteral orifice is identified and the 8 French dilator is placed gently in the distal ureter. A plug pilogram demonstrates a normal ureter and collecting system. The stone is identified faintly on scout fluoroscopy, but no clear filling defect is demonstrated. A sensor guide wire is passed via the 8 French dilator to the kidney. The 8 French dilator is passed to the kidney giving a sense of the capacity of the ureter. Okay, Ready, let's have the 10 French sheet. The cystoscope is removed while the guide wire and the 8 French dilator are maintained in the kidney. The 10 French sheath is passed easily over the 8 French dilator, indicating that the ureter will likely be accepting of the access sheath. So that one in easy. The 8 and 10 French dilators are then removed, and the inner 13 French obturator of the navigator access sheath is passed without significant resistance. The entire access sheath is now inserted. Get the laser. We use that uh, disposable fiber just for kicks. Disposable fiber. This is the last one, isn't it? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Here we are, my friend. There it goes. Flexible ureteroscope is now passed to the kidney. The FlexX2 is an ideal tool to completely examine the entirety of the collecting system because of its symmetric 270 degree deflection and excellent image. Initial inspection is hampered by mucousy debris within the kidneys. Once the irrigation has been working for a while and we've begun to clear out some of the mucus, the image will be much better. An initial task is to evaluate the upper pole to define an acceptable calyx. Under combined fluoroscopic and endoscopic guidance, I'm looking around the kidney 
having a good look in every calyx. We're now down in the lower pole where we can see the stone and it's difficult to believe that stone like this was resistant to shockwave, but it was. Alright, Ernie, we're going to do the basket the transfer job now. I need that basket. No, I'll secure that. Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, it's The stone is grasped with a 1.9 for inch zero tip basket. Under fluoroscopic guidance, the stone is transferred to the upper pole. Now bringing the stone back to the region of the UPJ and I'm beginning to probe towards the top. Use a lot of x-ray guidance at this part because the stone obviously obstructs the visibility. Sometimes the stones are difficult to disengage from the basket and what I'll do here is to almost retroflex the basket in an open position then close it once it's flopped away from the stone. Demonstrating the laser uh, aiming beam on my thumb absolutely must see an aiming beam before loading the fiber. The tip of the ureteroscope is straight at this time. You should never pass a laser fiber with the scope deflected. We exclusively use 200 micron laser fibers with flexible ureteroscopy because of their minimal impairment to deflection and irrigation. I usually use the Sharplin reusable fiber, but the luminous single-use fiber, which we're using today, is also acceptable. This may be a good alternative for low-volume centers, as the Sharplin fibers are relatively expensive if they are not getting multiple uses. Visibility with the laser is initially limited by mucousy debris, but this clears after initial firing of the laser. Depending on the appearance of the stone, laser settings are usually about one joule at 10 hertz. For obviously dense stones, the energy is increased to 1.5 to 1.8 joules, and frequency is dropped down to five to eight hertz. For less dense appearing larger stones, the energy is dropped to 0.6 joules and the rate increased to 15. I'm trying multiple different areas of the stone, trying to find an area of weakness which will fragment. It's not uncommon to titrate the energy and the frequency during the case depending on how the stone is fragmenting. The goal is to reduce the stone to two to three millimeter fragments. I want the least number of fragments but the fragments must be small enough to pass through the access sheath. As a general rule, I prefer to have patients under general anesthesia with controlled respiration, thus limiting renal respiratory movements to a predictable pattern. In challenging cases, this control can be the difference between failure and success. With experience, the surgeon can gain a sense for when the fragmentation has been adequate. 
trying to make the fewest number of pieces possible. Irrigating pressure this time is about 200 millimeters. I like to use the size of the laser fiber as an index for the size of the fragments. This laser fiber is less than a millimeter in diameter. This gentle rocking movements of my wrist to position the laser fiber. Okay, good. Stand by. Having reduced the stone to appropriate fragments, basket extraction is commenced. As fragment extraction commences, the surgeon gets a sense for the adequacy of fragmentation. I usually start with one of the larger fragments so that I can identify early on if additional laser work is required. In this case, I have grabbed two fragments and they are going to be too large to come through together. Rather than forcing the issue, the stones are returned to the upper pole where one of the fragments is dropped and the other is successfully retrieved. So that was kind of a nice maneuver to grab there, Paul. Hitting too much and deciding to put it back. If you cannot see, you will not succeed. We have been very pleased with the Stortz OR1 system. The offset camera maintains perspective allowing confident negotiation of the ureteroscope through the kidney. A particular feature which is absolutely crucial is excellent contrast within the red zone of the color spectrum. Reliable video is a major contributor to our success. A key element to visibility is maintaining a clear operative field. We exclusively use a hard case power irrigation system which holds a three liter irrigation bag. We rarely use more than a single liter and have had to use an additional bag of irrigant just once in the last two years. This unit is capable of up to nearly 600 millimeters of pressure. In the presence of a ureteral access sheath, our usual working pressure is 150 to 200 millimeters. The highest pressure I can remember using was 400 millimeters for a brief period while working on an astoundingly hard stone which required a 365 micron laser fiber. I have found pressure bag devices to be unreliable and unable to generate a pressure above 200 millimeters. I have not had much experience with hand pump devices as I am interested in continuous irrigation. Close. I do a little move with my right hand when I reposition the basket. That might be worthwhile snagging. Okay. I like to keep the stones about a centimeter ahead of the tip of my scope so I can see the ureteral wall and the stone. When do you do that? Are you pulling it out or? Uh, kind of when I, I get ready to put it back in. Okay. Sometimes a little tease is necessary to get it into the access sheath. So Power good. irrigation systems are useless if the irrigant ends up in your face. The Urlock device allows easy manipulation of fine caliber laser fibers and baskets while maintaining an adequate seal. Okay. 
you need to keep in mind that the shaft of the basket is less than a millimeter in size. As I place the scope, it's always going in with just fingertip pressure, I'm never forcing it. We exclusively use the 1.9 French zero tip basket for fragment clearance. It presents essentially no impairment to the ureteroscope deflection and can be flopped or conformed to calocele fornices. We use several strategies with the basket, usually just open halfway as this is large enough to capture fragments which are small enough to be retrieved. It may seem awkward to have the monitors up high like this, but it gives the assistant an excellent chance to uh, see the operative field and to be able to actually assist. Surprisingly, I find it comfortable to have them up nice and high. Now we're beginning to have fragments too small to be retrieved. Close. One thing, and stuff out at John's. <laughs> Nail you. Right, we're going to open slow beside this thing. It can be helpful to open the basket beside a desired fragment. Opening the basket halfway and draping it over the calocele fornix is frequently effective. It will reliably grasp fragments down to one millimeter. In this case, there is minimal bleeding and the field is essentially clear. As this is not always the case, the impact of basket diameter on irrigating characteristics can be crucial. We regularly demonstrate the importance of Pessoy's law, where the only significant variables we encounter are the area available for irrigant flow and the pressure applied. Three French instruments completely impair the ability to irrigate and cannot be compensated for even with power irrigation. In contrast, 1.9 French instruments cut the flow by about 50% compared to an empty working channel. Even though the 1.9 French basket is the smallest one available, it still impairs irrigation flow relative to the laser. Importantly, the flow at 150 millimeters through an empty scope can be approximated by 288 millimeters of pressure with a 1.9 French basket. This is within the operating range of our irrigation system. You got me turning down this little switch here? No, but I can. I'm going to do that right now. Hold yep. on. I'm going to zoom in, focus, and go ahead. Whatever. Okay, here goes. I'm actually going to turn the irrigation right. off at this point. Our visibility is great, and I'm worried about the fragments being blown around. I think we're pretty much done. Okay. Tell me when you're happy. Okay. All, All right, right, Ernie, yep. dump it. There we go. All right. I think I've completed the uh, extraction of the fragments at this point, and now it's time for uh, probably the most important step in making a patient stone free, which is a complete second look, examining every calyx on two occasions. Just some debris flowing around. 
it's going to be difficult to be sure of the size without a basket to compare to. I'm happy the upper pole is clean. We'll move through the mid pole calyces and down to the lower pole. A little bit of blood often builds up in this area. It's an important skill to be able to return back to the desired calyx. Occasionally, fluoroscopic guidance will be helpful to confirm in the correct position. Down in the lower pole where the stone started from. Oh, hang on, we've got a little chunk to get here. That's good. Well, we've got a couple of fragments that have uh, been left behind. put our basket back in and sneak up on them. This may seem like a tedious basket extraction, but I did want to show the entirety of the procedure. I'm going to open beside the fragment and scoot it up with the force of the irrigation and it went right up to the upper pole. The irrigation is off now, that's why the field is getting a little bit bloody. Complete inspection reveals one last fragment, which is retrieved. This is about as much fragment chasing as I ever need to do. Good. One last look around. One last complete look around, and we're done. I know that fragment is less than a millimeter in size. Okay, good. Guide wire and stent. The scope is withdrawn and a guide wire is replaced before removing the access sheath. Arnell, is that the same key you're going to use? Well, I'm replacing the sensor wire back up the access sheath. It coils easily within the kidney. If there's any concerns in the wrong place, I shoot a retrograde pilogram at this point. The stent is loaded on the guide wire and I'll run it up to the kidney under fingertip pressure. Okay. And now put on the pusher with the metal end towards the stent. Under fluoro guidance, the stent is inserted. I like to ensure that the stent has made it up to the kidney. Here it's forming a nice coil. We'll come down and look at the pubic symphysis, which is the landmark for the distal end. I want the pusher midway up the pubic symphysis for a man. Good, drain him out and we're done. I drop in the cystoscope under fingertip pressure, drain the bladder, and the procedure is complete. The patient will now be returned to recovery room, and he will go home in an hour and a half. 
The patient has now returned to see me in the office one month postoperatively. He has not had any complications. His stent was removed initially at one week. His one month follow up CAT scan demonstrates there are no detectable residual fragments. He will now be active in our stone prevention program. I'm Dr. Andrew Portis, Chair and Medical Director of the Health East Kidney Stone Institute. It's been nine years since we recorded this procedure in its entirety. From a technical perspective, little has changed. The procedure you've seen evolved over 500 prior procedures. Since that time, over 3,000 patients have been treated using these same principles. We've made no significant changes to the procedure since the original video was recorded. Our report of long-term outcomes after ureteroscopic laser lithotripsy with active fragment extraction has recently been accepted for publication in Urology. It is currently in press. After five years of follow-up, our retreatment rate was less than 10%. This compares favorably to a repeat surgery rate of 18% for similar patients in a Medicare sample at just 120 days. We believe the effectiveness of this procedure is associated with rigorous attention to detail and clearance of stone fragments. In the long-term follow-up study, rate of retreatment was closely associated with the size of persistent fragments after stone clearance. When surgery is required, our goal is to completely clear all stones from the affected ureter and kidney in a single procedure. Some might argue that complete stone clearance is inefficient or technically challenging. In our population, more than half of our patients have multiple stones and one third have stones in both the kidney and ureter. We recently reviewed the last 100 patients who had had no prior treatment. The average case time was 22 minutes. Only four of these 100 patients required repeat surgery in the next 120 days. We believe that this approach is highly efficient and effective for patients and for those that have to pay the bills. Having established reliable stone clearance, our energies are now devoted to improving the patient experience. The Healthy Kidney Stone Institute was inaugurated as a clinical entity six years ago. Our priorities are clear. The best surgery is no surgery. All patients with a ureteral stone are supported in attempts to pass the stone safely. We are actively investigating ways to better predict who will be successful and are developing strategies to increase success rates in borderline cases. When patients ultimately do require surgery, it should be safe, effective, and durable. Our ureteroscopic procedure remains the same and we are actively investigating ways to further reduce perioperative discomfort and repeat surgeries. We are actively investigating strategies to reduce the life impact of stone disease. We strive to reduce both the intensity of pain and its effect on our patient's daily function. To contact the Healthy's Kidney Stone Institute, call 651-326-3830 or call toll-free at 1-888-326-3830, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. A doctor's referral is not required to make an appointment. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.